ever since memes and news articles started hyping Christopher Nolan's decision to use no CGI for Oppenheimer, I couldn't wait to see how they would pull off the Trinity test scene. But when I finally got to see the explosion, something just felt off. It didn't have that gut-wrenching impact of a real new going off. It was more like fire from a gas leak, like the blew up a gas station and want us to believe it's a nuke. A true nuclear detonation should terrify the audience, but thanks to the loud bang at the end, shit woke me up in the theater. It kinda felt like a cheap jump scare, much like how horror films rely on jump scares when they lack genuine source of fear. Those of us who are into this nuclear lore could tell this shit didn't match up. Let me learn you some signs here. A real atomic bomb detonation begins with a very bright flash. Followed by a massive fireball and the shock wave and finally the towering mushroom cloud. But in the movie, everything went wrong. It felt lacking. You see, real nuke actually creates a giant mushroom cloud that spreads widely with roiling plasma. Just like the film script says, watch the roiling plasma become more visible in its hellish contortions climbing into the sky like the devil's claw. In the film, the scale seemed off too tall and narrow for a nuclear explosion. The distance from the observers didn't seem right. Even the bright flash didn't seem to be coming from the explosion itself. Shadows should fall behind the characters, but they're falling beside them instead. If you zoom out to the behind the scenes, you could see the big flashlights positioned off to the side, not lined up with the explosion as they should be, causing the light to hit at the wrong angle. This all got me thinking that if no one could not replicate a nuke, then no director can. Anyways, there are three reasons why this explosion ended up looking worse. First reason has to do with the type of explosion, as there are two types. Call it deflagration and detonation. If the flame front moves slower than the speed of sound, about 750 miles per hour, then that's called a deflagration. But if the flame front moves much faster than the speed of sound, ranging from 4,500 to 18,000 miles per hour, then that's a detonation. A real atomic bomb actually detonates because neutrons collide with uranium-235 isotopes, causing them to split and release more neutrons. These released neutrons can then collide with other uranium-235 isotopes creating a chain reaction that leads to a rapid and massive release of energy. This all happens in one millionth of a second, which is why nuclear bombs detonate with such destructive force. But the explosion you saw in the film was deflagration, not at all a detonation. This ended up as deflagration because of the fuel gasoline they used. Gasoline always deflagrates. Gasoline is a common choice for many Hollywood films since it's safer which is why Oppenheimer explosion looked like every other typical Hollywood explosion, just bigger. Oppenheimer's team claims they used over 60 gallons of gasoline for the explosion, but that's nothing compared to what the movie Spectre used. The movie Spectre used a whopping 22-23 gallons of kerosene, the most ever used in a film history, approved by Michael Bay, yet it still fell flat. It was just a waste of fuel. But some films stand out. In the film Blown Away, the explosion feels super concussive because they used real high explosives like dynamite. The shockwave from the explosion shattered around 8,000 windows in East Boston. No one should have gone for big quantities of high explosives like TNT or dynamite instead of gasoline. Unlike gasoline, TNT and dynamite always detonate and create massive shockwaves. For instance, here is a 100 ton TNT test. This is a 500 ton TNT test run by the USA that kinda resembles a nuke. Explosion using dynamite. This is the shock impact from dynamite explosion.
But one thing's for sure, no amount of TNT, dynamite or gasoline can exactly replicate the massive detonation of a nuke, especially the shape and how the expelled gases behave and move after the nuke detonates. For a scale of reference, this is a TNT explosion and this is a nuclear explosion. Despite the TNT explosion being smaller, camera techniques like force perspective can make it look bigger. Universal Studio could easily afford TNT. I mean, come on, even fucking YouTubers out here pulling off better explosions with high explosives. Why did they still go with gasoline? Wait, before thinking about that, how many dinosaurs had to die to make the gasoline that ignited this shithole? I don't know, man. But it takes one Godzilla to make this motherfucking right. Godzilla minus a one. The scene is tight. Tight, 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 yeah! Oh, blue, yellow, pink! Whatever, man, just keep bringing me that. Even though the CG explosion does not resemble a nuke, they got the blast wave right. This is terrifying. You could see the sheer force tossing people away, and the blast wave tearing the fuck apart the buildings in an apocalyptic style. The initial shock wave passes through an area and disperses air, creating a wider low pressure area. Surrounding air then rapidly rushes back in to fill this void. This phenomenon looks like the shockwave initially pushing dust and debris away, then pulling them back towards the detonation site. Godzilla Minus One depicted this accurately. Just look at the scale of the smoke, it's fucking massive. Fear lies in the details. And here Oppenheimer missed almost every basic detail of a nuke. Director Komi effects supervisor Takashi Yamazaki and VFX studio Shiragami of 35 members pulled off this entire film with just one tenth of the budget of Oppenheimer, but yet CGI still looks so dope. Nolan kind of fucked up with his decision not to use any CGI for the explosion. Man, Christopher Nolan has become Batman for this film, like how Batman has one rule, not to get anybody. Also Nolan's got one rule, not to use CGI. He wanted everything to be photographed. Computer graphics, they're extremely versatile and the detail that can be achieved and the variety of imagery that can be achieved is obviously unparalleled. But they tend to feel a little anodyne, a little safe. It's very difficult to have computer graphics convey threat, which is why they have to be used very carefully in horror movies, for example. It's, it's difficult to make CG uh, threatening. I don't think anyone felt threatened watching this puff of gas either. I know CG explosions are really hard to simulate to look real. Every detail from animation to color grading needs to be perfect to create such impact. CG might not exactly replicate a nuclear explosion, but it is way better than a gasoline explosion. It's become so easy to spot CGI these days as VFX artists are stuck dealing with toxic work culture and tight deadlines from production companies. They rush out their work and CG ends up looking crap. This would not be the case with known films. For Interstellar, Nolan brought in a theoretical physicist and VFX artist to create a black hole. In 2014, Nolan had any idea how a black hole looked like, yet they still managed to create an almost accurate looking one. You see around a black hole, the gravity is so strong that it warps space and time, causing light to bend in ways that are very different from what we observe in everyday life. Traditional CGI softwares cannot handle such extreme bending of light. So VFX Studio DNEG that worked for this film had to create a special software called DNGR, Double Negative Gravitational Renderer, from scratch just for this black hole scene alone. This renderer uses Einstein's equations of general relativity as it describes how light behaves near such extreme gravitational forces. The complexity of these calculations resulted in processing 800 terafucking bytes of data. Some individual frames of the black hole took around 100 hours to render 
and it took more than 100 days to render the whole scene. Like in the stellar, he should have teamed up with nuclear experts and VFX artists to simulate a nuke. Since there are a lot of archive footages of nukes available on the internet, but instead he let only special effects team do all the job alone and ruined it. Norm really uses these real stunts as a hook to sell his films. For Tenet, a film known for its great dialogues. Why don't we better put our head out before the bomb goes off, eh? For Tenet, they bought an old sound for 7 for 1.2 million just to crash it into a building. You wanna crash a plane? But not from the air. No one's so dramatic. They heavily pushed this in marketing. One of the first things I asked Chris was, you know, how big do you want the plane? He uh, laughed, and I said, I think I can get you a real plane. I'm like, how are they gonna pull this off? I'm like, there's no way they're gonna crash this thing into that building. And a lot of these sequences are you gonna read in the script, and you just think, yeah, it would be cool in a movie. And then you get to set and say, yeah, we got a 747 and we're crashing into a building. That's how we're achieving the 747 crashing into a building. It feels very, very real, essentially because it is real. <laughs> Also, Dunkirk made a bunch of headlines for not using any green screens throughout the film. Nolan's statement about using no CGI in Oppenheimer went insanely viral, sparking memes all over the internet. Memes alone promoted the film. Without the no CGI buzz, I don't think such an R-rated biopic that's neither like a part of a franchise nor a superhero film would have a chance of collecting nearly a billion dollars. Nolan slapped on some really terrifying details of nukes, like a crater for instance. Blown up a nuke usually leaves a horrifyingly massive crater beneath the blast. In the Trinity test, the crater was almost 300 feet wide and 8 feet deep, nearly the size of the US Capitol building. Another detail that's even more terrifying is extra illusion. This is the interview of a veteran who witnessed a nuclear bomb test. When the flash hit you, you could see the x-rays of your hands through your closed eyes. Russia, so hands over your eyes you saw every bone in your hand. If I was looking at you now, I would see all your bones. You would see all the blood vessels and everything, and the bones a lot. The flash from the nuke would be so bright that people could see bones and blood vessels through the flash. It's not radiation or x-rays that make the bones visible. It's just that the flash is so bright. It can penetrate through the flesh, making bones momentarily visible. Opinot just created a new weapon. He created a new world of fear, and we live in it. The bomb on Japan turned everything into smoke. He had to inhale all of that later to cope with the guilt. Coming back to the question, why did they still choose gasoline over any high explosives? Budget and marketing hook. Among Christopher Nolan's entire filmography, Tenet was his most expensive film after The Dark Knight Rises, but Tenet lost around 100 million at the box office. This loss likely influenced Nolan to cut down the budget for his next film, Oppenheimer. Tenet was shot over 96 days, while Dunkirk was shot in 68 days. Oppenheimer was initially scheduled for more than 85 days, but when Nolan realized building the Los Alamos set alone was going to cost way more than expected, around $20 million, he had to cut 30 days from the schedule, bringing it down to 55, to keep the total budget under 100 million. This probably left them short on budget for the explosion, so they went with gasoline instead of TNT, since it's cheaper and safer. Even CG would be much more expensive considering heavy detailing of a nuke. Reference Out of all the better footages available on nuclear tests, they used only Trinity test footage as a reference. This ruined the film's explosion, because the footage was visually constrained by its nighttime setting, with the visibility mostly limited to the fireball and the mushroom cloud. Um, we, we had the advantage of the original Trinity test being shot at night, so all of the um, archival footage that we were using as reference is it's essentially self-illuminating so it doesn't it's really quite constrained to that quite a small kind of area that's only the 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 bomb and the cloud um column itself that's lit and then it, it quite quickly sort of dissipates and turns back to night and we were both fairly confident that if we made a big enough explosion we would be able to um manipulate that in a way to make it feel much bigger and we we basically did pretty straightforward things of slowing it down and shooting at high frame rates and, and then further retiming and layering. So they likely thought a big fiery explosion would be enough to make it look close to the real footage. So to get such a big fiery explosion, there's no better option than gasoline, since gasoline burns slower and fire from the gasoline explosion lasts longer than that of TNTs. You see prolonged fire makes it easier to capture the fire on camera as fire stays longer and this can be achieved with fewer gallons of gasoline. On the other side, TNT is better at producing shock waves and throwing off the debris, but gasoline cannot do that. 
metaphor still on fire. Well, did you, although we weren't ever trying to exactly reproduce it, it was kind of in a in a more, I suppose, slightly in the in the same vein as the the other work that was relating to his thoughts and ideas. It was a, a sort of artistic, slightly more artistic interpretation of of the actual footage. Moreover, fiery gasoline explosion is all more fitting for the film score metaphor. This close shot of fire from the explosion also rolls at the beginning of the film with a line that says Prometheus stole fire from the gods and gave it to a man. For this, he was chained to a rock and tortured for eternity. This metaphor draws a parallel between Oppenheimer and the titan Prometheus from Greek mythology. The nuclear bomb metaphorically is stolen fire from gods. I think choosing gasoline for the explosion makes sense for the intended fiery visual.